Hi everyone and welcome to today's carol service. We are the Johnson family minus one member. I'm Chris. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Morella. And I have a younger sister Jodie who's not here right now. As part of our worship this morning, we're going to sing a number of Christmas carols. Uh, there will be a special performance from our youth band, a song from our Farsi fellowship, and a message from Pastor Tim. We hope it blesses and encourages you.
Let me begin by wishing you all a very Merry Christmas. But I also want to give you a greeting that was used several times in the record of events surrounding Jesus' birth, that which we are celebrating this time of year. In some passages that lead up to and follow the birth of Jesus, these words were used again and again. And this was the first Christmas greeting. Fear not. Possibly more than any other year I can remember, more people are caught in the grip of fears, anxiety and stress. Perhaps more so during this Christmas season. Now incidentally, what do you call the fear of Santa Claus? Claustrophobia? I guess that's probably only if he locks you in a small, tightly confined space, but that probably sounds a little bit darker than I was thinking it. But believe it or not, there is an actual fear called Santaphobia. But as one writer states, there's no special word assigned to the fear of Christmas. Maybe because Christmas is meant to be a time of peace, joy, renewed hope and goodwill to men and women. But if you look up Christmas and fear in an online search engine, it produces a very different situation. Maybe some of the symptoms of what we have created Christmas into. You can conclude, even pre-COVID, for many, Christmas is a scary time. Apart from the obvious fear of loneliness, eremophobia, there's crowds, maybe not so much this year, but there's inoclophobia. And there's good news, euphobia. There are some unnamed fears that are unique to Christmas time. Now, Psychology Today, in a funny article a few years ago, listed 12 neuroses of Christmas, and these are my personal favourites. Angoraphobia, which is the fear of the auntie who keeps knitting horrible jumpers that you have to wear while she's visiting. How about this one? 
Borderline personality disorder. The inability to stop ordering more and more items to be delivered to your home. And lastly, North Polar Disorder. The chronic fear that someone's up on your roof. Christmas should be a time that's joyous, happy, and most of all, Christ-centered. Yet the season is full of fear. Fear of not having enough money. Fear of not meeting everyone's expectations. What if I didn't get them the right gift? Or what if they give me a better gift than I got them? We worry over meals, over who will be there and who will not. This year, worry over who we can or should meet with. Fear creeps in. And today, I want us around the carols to hear three times that God sent angelic messengers to the earth with messages connected to the birth of his son, Jesus. If you've watched a nativity this year or in other years, you will have heard or seen these passages played out. If not, go onto YouTube and watch our one that we showed last week, it was brilliant. Each time the messengers brought big news, news which upset the hearts of their hearers. However, they also came with a message of peace. Three times angels appeared. Three times they spoke the words, fear not. Now we're going to take some time this morning to examine the messages of these angels and learn for ourselves what it means to fear not. And our first one is, we are told, fear not, but believe. We're going to have our first reading from Luke 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 31 and 34 to 35. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured one. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Fear not, Mary, the angel told her. For you have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Verses 34 to 35. Mary asked the angel, But how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. When our lives don't go as we planned, it's easy to fear what we don't know. And at this point, we can often blame God. I've spoken to quite a few people, even people who call themselves atheists, who blame a God they say that they don't believe in. Yet I know from my own life, the biggest lessons that I've learned are not in the easy times, the unchallenging times, but in the challenging, in the difficult, tumultuous season. And the Bible reassures us that God loves us again and again. But like a good parent, sometimes he has to allow us to travel a difficult path, difficult times, so that we can grow in ourselves, in him, and come to know him in a better way. Yet when these times come, it is natural to question God. Let's look for a moment at Mary's situation. If Mary were to be a part of God's plan, then she faced the possibility of having her engagement to Joseph broken. She knew that Joseph, in that culture, would have the legal right to have her executed when it becomes known that she was pregnant. And even if somehow Joseph would still marry her, she knew how people would talk. Some things never change. They would have a reputation for being sexually promiscuous. And that was not a good situation for a young Jewish girl in first century Palestine to find herself in. God called on Mary to step out in faith in order to be part of his daring plan. But being a part of the plan would cost Mary something. Yet Mary was willing to step out in faith because she knew God loved her. And therein lies the difference between when God challenges us to step out in faith and the world that would ask us to take a risk. In this world, sometimes the challenge to do something risky comes from those who don't really love us or have our our best interest at heart. The challenge doesn't have to be spoken. It may just be the unspoken. It may be peer pressure to fit in with the crowd. We've all been there in that position at one time or another, I'm sure. 
God won't challenge us to do something just for fun. He won't pressure us to fit in with the crowd. God loves us and only wants what's best for our lives. God is not going to manipulate us and then laugh at us when we fall on our faces. Mary asked some legitimate questions if she was going to become pregnant. She would like to know how this was going to happen. However, Mary did not let her question stop her. Mary said yes to the part of the plan that God had given her. When God challenges you to move out in faith, to be a part of a God-given dream, it's all right to ask some questions. It's okay to say, God, that's a great dream, but how are we supposed to get to there? God answered Mary. And it's my experience and that of many Christians alive today that he answers today too. It's important to understand that God didn't give Mary all the details. Gabriel only gave Mary enough information so that she could make a willing response to God's plan. God will give us just enough light for the path that is before us. As the psalmist says in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light to my path. So we're told firstly, fear not and believe. And secondly, well, let's sing the carol together, O Holy Night, first. See? 
So we're told to fear not and believe. And secondly, we're told to fear not and obey. Let's have our second reading, Matthew 1. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before marriage took place, while she was still virgin, she became pregnant through her, the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. How often have we read or heard the Christmas story without stopping to consider the emotions of Joseph that he had to deal with in order to submit to God in ways which were contrary to his every natural inclination? The Bible doesn't tell us when Joseph learned of Mary's pregnancy or who told him. But when Joseph learned of the situation, there appeared to be only two possible solutions. One, he could divorce Mary quietly and have her sent off until the baby was born. Or secondly, he could divorce her publicly, but this would mean subjecting her to public humiliation. And this, this option could even have resulted in Mary's death, as we heard before, according to the Old Testament law. But as, as he thought about the situation, he received a message from heaven, beginning in verse 20. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary, Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfil the Lord's message through his prophet. Look! The virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born and Joseph named him Jesus. The Bible doesn't say much about Joseph. But we know this one thing, Joseph kept his ears tuned to heaven. And in spite of the cultural expectations and practices, Joseph listened to the voice of God, even when it took him through tough times. I'm sure that Joseph must have thought something like this. I don't understand all of what I've been told. I can't explain it. I'm not even sure if I'm happy about it, but if it's God's will, then count me in. So whatever you're facing this season, don't fear God's purposes. They may look bleak in the beginning, but in the end, God is working out all things for our good and for his glory. The Apostle Paul would later go on to write in Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that all things will happen nice and perfect. In fact, Paul was writing that text from a prison cell. Rather, it says that all things work together for good when we are following his purposes in our lives. Later in his letter to the church at Corinth, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Whatever we are called upon to endure in this life for his sake, will in the end be found to be worth it all. So firstly, we're told to fear not and believe. Secondly, we've just heard that we're told to fear not and obey. And let's sing another carol, Angels from the Realms of Glory, before we come back for our last brief point.
We're told to fear not and believe, to fear not and obey. And thirdly, we're told, fear not because you are important to God. Let's have our third reading, Luke 2. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Saviour, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Why were these shepherds afraid? Well, the truth is that ordinary people have always displayed fear when they were confronted with the reality of God. Because coming face to face with the Almighty has a way of making us face up with who we really are. You may wonder that if God is even aware you exist, he probably doesn't have a very favourable opinion of you. A lot of people I speak to express that deep down. They feel like that. And the appearance of the angels to the shepherds tells us, no matter how insignificant you may think you are, God knows you and you're important to him. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that a few of you were wise in the world's eyes, or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they're wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. You see, shepherds were just ordinary, common people. They were not the social elite. They were just common working folks. In fact, in that culture, they were really the lowest of the low. Most likely, these shepherds were tending sheep outside Bethlehem, and these may have been the sheep being prepared for the temple sacrifices we read of. In verse 15, we read, When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. This decision by the shepherds was a great example of people acting in faith in what God has said. They heard the message and they did something about it. They trusted what God had said and went and checked it out for themselves. Verse 16 says, They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. The shepherds did what we must do. They came to Christ in faith. God had brought the shepherds to the stable as witnesses of the supernatural events which happened that evening. And the shepherds did that marvellously. Three times the angels came and three times there was a reaction based in fear. However, when the fear had been dealt with and the Lord's message was allowed to come through, the message was seen for what it really was, a promise of grace. So it is this Christmas season. There may be those things around you that you fear, but if you can hear the lesson that Mary, Joseph and the shepherds learned, fear not and believe, fear not and obey, Fear not because you're important to God. See, it's so easy to hear and breeze through this story, which for many of us we've heard time and time again, without properly taking time to consider it. I hope you will have the opportunity this season, as Mary did, to ponder, that is to think on these things in your heart. As a church, we'd love to engage with any questions that you have, as we seek to have a proper Christ Mass. Christmas with Christ right at the beginning of it. Based around Christ Jesus, who came to give you hope and peace, whatever fears may come against you in this season or the forthcoming. Too certain for shepherds in fields 
as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so
Thank you for joining us this week. On Christmas Eve from 5 to 6 p.m., the church will be going live on YouTube with a special winter warmer, cozy Christmas, fireside carol service. And on Christmas Day itself, there's an opportunity for you to connect with other members of the church by Zoom, our new friend Zoom, uh, at 10 a.m. A link will be sent out by email. And that'll be followed by our Christmas service at 10.30 a.m. We hope you enjoyed the rest of the day. Bye. Bye.